Well, hello again. Um, you guys already know me if you uh, were more awake than I was this morning. Um, I uh, am going to talk about evolving reactive extensions uh, for JavaScript. So before I get started, um, just hands up or, or nod at me or something if uh, you, you've heard of Rx or, or have used Rx. Um, cool. That's more hands than I expected. Um, how about people who would consider themselves even slightly above beginner level? Maybe. <laughs> oh, that guy right there. All right. Um, cool. Well, actually, that's perfect because I, I, I tried to make the first half of my talk a, an intense introduction, um, whereas the second half of my talk is going to be flying into the space. Um, so, cool. Well, that's who I uh, am. And I'm going to introduce uh, the observable type to everybody. Um, and if you've read a little bit about the observable type or you've heard some people talk about it, um, it might sound just like another event emitter or event dispatcher or thing that you subscribe to. You give it a callback and then it, it gives you some data later, um, which is partly true. But the observable is absolutely not in any way like even remotely related to any of these concepts right here. Um, and that's the biggest hurdle uh, learning Rx is we all know um, reactive programming. We all use event handlers and uh, get callbacks later, but um, nothing is uh, nothing is, is Rx. Um, all of these guys are essentially the same thing. They're an array of callbacks. You can uh, call a function that'll iterate over the array and then call all those callbacks with the same piece of data. That's all of these guys do that. Um, an observable. Uh, in my words, is the idea of future values, maybe. Um, but what does that mean? So I'll take a look at some other ideas of future values. Um, in the first quadrant, we've got functions. And it, it may seem strange to call a function an idea of a value. Um, but ultimately, that, that's kind of what it is. Um, it's not the value yet. It produces a value whenever you, you want it to, um, <clears throat> but functions are synchronous. So a function can synchronously give you back a value. Um, something that can synchronously give you back multiple values would be an enumerable. Um, <clears throat> something that can asynchronously give you back a single value is uh, a promise. And then um, an observable is something that can uh, asynchronously give you back multiple values. Um, I don't particularly like talking about it in terms of synchronous versus asynchronous because they kind of imply that asynchronous will always be some point in the future. Um, instead, I like to think about it in terms of pull versus push. Um, and these concepts really apply to, uh, to um, they relate to who's consuming uh, one of these ideas of values. Um, so if you're a function or an enumerable and you're the consumer, you're going to pull the value. You get to decide when you want the value. Um, if you're an enumerable, you get to uh, you know, do a for loop over it. Uh, but if you're these two bottom guys, it's, it's, it's actually inverted. Um, the promise or the observable decides when the consumer receives a value. Um, and the consumer doesn't really have any choice when it gets that value. Um, so let's talk about the just basic functions. Um, this is kind of what I mean when I say it's an idea of a value. Uh, we can instantiate a function, in this case, a function that returns us a random number. Um, but we haven't really done anything except like, create that idea of a future random number. Um, but at the bottom here, we then go and get that value. Uh, this is also referred to as laziness. Um, a lot of people see the word lazy and either think uh, slacking off or that it's related to something else. Um, that's really the concept, that you instantiate some sort of wrapper that later, when you want, you can invoke and uh, get the value from it. So the anatomy of an observable is if an observable is uh, the idea of future values, maybe, then just like with functions, uh, with observables, there's the creation step. Um, then there's the subscription step, which is analogous to calling the observable, uh, like you would call a function. But then the observable has something that the functions don't have, um, which is disposal. <sighs> so w when you call a function if in a single-threaded language, there's really no way to interrupt the function. Um, you, you invoke it, and then it gives you back the value. But with an observable, especially whenever uh, 
uh, it could give you those values over time, you, you might want to cancel. You might want to stop and stop listening and, and tell it to shut up. Um, and that's where disposal comes in. So right here, just to break this down, here's kind of a creation step. If we're just going to create an observable that's going to give us random numbers in the future, uh, we can just do it with the observable uh, uh, create factory. And that just takes a subscriber function. Um, the subscriber function actually gets run whenever you subscribe. So like every single subscriber will re-invoke this function. So in our case, this function is going to instantiate or going to uh, allocate a set timeout callback uh, for 1,000 milliseconds from now. <clears throat> and then here's the third step disposal that functions don't have. Um, you can't interrupt functions. But this, theoretically, after you subscribed, but before the set timeout had triggered, you could decide to throw away your subscription, and we want to clean up that memory. We, we wouldn't want this set timeout to keep going. Um, and so this last step right here I, I marked with a pink star because this is actually where we call random numbers dot subscribe, that's actually like the same thing as doing function dot apply or function dot call. So next. And this is like one of my favorite little tests. Um, once, I, once I tell people that, they're like, oh yeah, I, I totally get that, all right. Um, <clears throat> but then I throw this at them. So if I just have this random numbers observable, uh, and I subscribe to it twice, and then I, I print out the results, um, what do you think happens? A lot of people say the same random number gets printed. And I don't fault them for that. That's the, that's the event emitter model. Um, but this is what happens. The first guy gets a random number. The second guy gets a completely different random number. And here's why. So when we create it, and then we subscribe to it, then we run the, the subscriber function for the first subscription, which calls set timeout. Then we run the subscriber function for the second subscription, and then eventually our set timeout completes for the first thing, and we call subscriber.next and pass it math.random, um, and then we, we call uh, subscriber.complete. Um, then set timeout for the second subscription, number two, also uh, resolves, and then we pass the second subscriber a different random number. Um, so just like if this were a function, and you called this random numbers function twice, you would get two different random numbers out. I mean, that's all it is. An observable is a future function. So if, ob if observables aren't event emitters, event dispatchers, or event delegates, what are they? They are functions. And here's my real definition for observable. This is what I, I, I tell to people when I want to freak them out. Um, I say observable is a function that, when invoked, returns zero to infinity values between now and the end of time. Um, which I, I think is a pretty accurate you know, answer. Um, observables have operators. And what are operators? Operators are methods that perform calculations on the values. Things like map, filter, scan, reduce. If you're familiar with the array extras, or lodash, or underscore, um, then you'll be familiar with a lot of these. But then observable also has a lot of ones that are specific to it. Um, if you're talking about asynchronous values, then you're talking about temporal operators like uh, delay, debounce, time interval, throttle. Um, some people call it lodash for events. I don't call it that, but you can. Um, so what does an operator actually look like? Like this is just kind of a, a, a real basic crash course introduction. There's a lot more to this. But if, if we had kind of this basic structure of an observable where the constructor takes a subscribe function, it just puts it on itself, um, <clears throat> and then it also defines the map operator. Well, the map operator takes a function, um, it's going to return a new observable. What we have to do is we have to say that who we currently are so that when someone subscribes to this new observable, they can, they, they can, we can call back to our source and uh, map the events that our source is going to give us. So in this way, we kind of create this chain. So if we just have this observable chain, observable.of uh, creates an observable that will on next the arguments that you give it. Um, then we have all these cool filters that we can apply uh, functions over the events and change them as they go through. All right, so this part I usually don't talk about. Because even people who like Rx don't like schedulers. Um, 
Schedulers are centralized dispatchers to control concurrency. And the reason I'm talking about this is because uh, the rest of my talk has a lot to do with this part. This is really kind of a deep in, inside part of Rx that a lot of people don't really have to worry about. Um, but they're, they're absolutely key. Uh, if, you've got all, if you're thinking about you have all these asynchronous observables happening, um, you might subscribe to this one and that one. They might be getting events in at different times. You really want to kind of send them through a central dispatcher or uh, be able to coordinate events some way. Um, and that's really what schedules, schedulers give you. So uh, there's a couple different schedulers in Rx. There's the immediate scheduler, which does sort of, has sort of a trampolining. It pushes actions onto a queue. Um, and pops them off in a while loop. There's the timeout scheduler, which just uses a set timeout. Um, the request animation frame scheduler is one of my favorites because it allows you to very easily synchronize um, going from model updates to DOM rendering uh, without thrashing uh, the DOM. So what do schedulers look like? If I was gonna create the range operator, Range is kind of like, like Lodash's range. You give it like a start value and a length, and then it, it, you know, in Lodash it would give you back an array of all those numbers. Well, in Observable we want to just iterate and create those numbers lazily. Um, but you can give the range an optional scheduler. And this is really what happens with the scheduler. Scheduler has a schedule method that takes a, takes a closure uh, and then optionally some state at the end. And then what you can do is the action can recursively reschedule itself um, until it decides that it's done and it doesn't need to anymore. Um, this is really just there to uh, blow your minds. You don't really have to read it. But schedulers are also useful. They can be passed into certain operators. Like in this case, um, I've got a mouse move event that might happen super fast. Well, I want to throttle, but I want to throttle on the request animation frame. So that way, I only call my react.render down here um, whenever the browser's ready to paint. Whew, all right, that was the crash course into Rx. I hope you guys understood it. Um, this is really what this next talk, this talk is actually about. Um, the next version of Rx. It's officially gonna be number five. Um, that's been sanctioned by the team at Microsoft. And it's available at github.com slash reactivex slash rxjs. And we have an amazing contributor list. In addition to companies um, like where I worked, uh, we've got people from the Google team, uh, obviously the RX team at Microsoft, um, Mr. Andre Stoltz over there. Uh, ben at, at Netflix has been instrumental. He's kind of the project lead. Um, he coordinates everything. He's big into open source. And this OJ Kwan over here, I don't know where the hell he came from, but I'm glad he's here. Um, these guys are prolific. They've written way more code than I have in Rx, so um, the rest of the contributors are also important. I just can't talk about them all. Uh, so the primary goals for this version of Rx is modularity, improving performance, improving the debugging story, uh, improving extensibility, like what if you want to extend observable? Um, and then also writing much easier to read <laughs> and write unit tests. Um, if anybody's ever seen Rx's unit tests, they aren't necessarily the nicest to you. In terms of modularity, that's been a big complaint from everybody in the node world is that you, with Rx you've always kind of had to bring in everything or nothing. Um, and these sort of like light builds that Matt would uh, compile never really did it for him. So in this latest one, if you're using something like TypeScript or ES6, you can sort of import just the operators you want um, with modules. So that, um, the new Rx so far is on average 4.3 times faster um, than current Rx. Um, numbers I've seen personally on my machine are up to 11 times, but uh, Ben was telling me that some of the macro tests are sometimes 26 times faster. So that's, that's just uh, ridiculous. I mean, I don't know anything that gets 26 times faster. Um, so we have a full uh, performance test suite, which is something Rx really never shipped with, like they were kind of added on later. But we've also got, um, with the, the Google Angular team, with the, they got the benchmark tests running. So they're, if you're crazy enough to run those, they'll like spin up 100 instances of Chrome and like thrash the DOM a whole bunch and see how Rx performs. It's, it's really being battle tested pretty well. Um, on the memory front, we're, 
at least 50% fewer allocations on subscribe and potentially up to 90 depending on what schedulers you're using, um, which is just amazing. Um, debugging too, also the, the call stacks are massively improved. If anybody's ever debugged or had to step through the internals of Rx, um, you know, you, you on next and then it goes to an internal on next and that goes to an abstract observer next and then that one goes to a try catcher and then the other one comes back and then you accidentally hit the um, other key that steps over and now you've lost your place. So that's been a, a, a big help with the, the newest version of Rx. Um, I put together just a few little examples just to see the difference um, between the two. Is that one? Okay. So something we really needed at Netflix, like they were, were very, very anti Rx on Node. Um, ironically, Netflix, you know, writing Rx Java and then using RxJS in the client everywhere, the Node guys weren't having it. So this is kind of what spurred this. We really needed to be able to get <coughs> better looking uh, flame graphs. So this is just an example where I did a flat map followed up by another flat map. Really not that crazy, like it actually happens all the time. Um, and that's what Rx looks like today. Rx5 looks like that, which I don't know if that makes any difference. But what you see is like a lot of this stuff that's all, all broken up. Number one, there's a lot of uh, un de-optimized functions because they're doing a lot of try catches everywhere. But also you can't really follow an event all the way through the next because it constantly jumps back to the schedulers. Um, so having these, these wider lines that then you can see, oh, that's where it's taking all the time um, is really great, especially on the server. And here's another one where I use switch map. I did a switch map and then a switch map in Rx4. And actually, this one kind of broke my computer. Um, the graph was so long that I had to take screenshots in chunks. I mean, this is, it was just wild. And this is what it looks like in Rx5. So pretty, pretty big improvement there. Um, so hope that's useful for everybody. So what, what got us to this point? Um, <clears throat> we decided we, we needed to overhaul the schedulers. Internally, the schedulers do a lot for us. They're um, a really great concept, but they, there's a lot of legacy from C Sharp and, and uh, other stuff. Um, we also completely changed the architecture of how operators are implemented. Um, we implement them with classes and uh, very, very few closures um, because we realized talking to the, the V8 team that uh, they optimize prototype lookups and um, can create anonymous inner classes and, and do some optimizations there. Um, we're also able to unify the observer and the, the subscriber or the disposable. So that's how we actually get just off the top 50% fewer allocations because those were always allocated in pairs and now they're a single object. Um, we also flatten the disposable tree, so if you subscribe to an observable and it's got flat maps and stuff inside of it, you don't know what's happening. There's, a, there's this you know, kind of expansive disposable tree that could potentially get created. We flattened all of that into a single list um, by sharing the same composite disposable between everybody all the way through. Um, so removing disposables is faster, it's less memory. Um, and then we also removed all these try catches from the internals because if we're calling framework internal code, uh, and you know we kind of trust our unit tests, then we're pretty sure we're not going to get runtime exceptions. Um, and so all the try catches we're doing were just being annoying for debugging and deoptimizing our functions. Um, the flat map versus lift discussion is kind of interesting. We, we went from an architecture where everything was was kind of architected off of flat map. Basically, flat map is this God operator that can implement any other operator um, if you are tricky enough. Uh, so flat maps signature, not to get too TypeScripty into this, but um, it's a function that goes from type T to type R. Uh, it takes a higher order function, like it's a higher order function, so it takes a function that accepts the value of T and then returns an observable of R and then merges that together. Um, if anybody, there's a lot of functional people here, so people are probably familiar. Um, this is monadic bind. So this is exactly the signature of uh, bind. So we moved to, to lift, which is, at first looks kind of similar, but then looks a little stranger. Um, it's also a function that goes from T to R, but it takes uh, a selector that doesn't take a value, it takes a subscriber of T and returns uh, a subscriber of R. 
but then somehow returns an observable of R, and it's just kind of this black magic voodoo. Um, this is kind of the, the flat map way of doing things. This is like a, a map function that I showed you before, where we get our projection function, we sort of save out the source, then we just allocate a new observable and return it. This is problematic for a couple of reasons because number one, closure scope is, is slower than um, accessing things on a prototype. Uh, number two is it's inflexible, so if you subclass observable, like subject or you know, your custom type, and then you call map, well now you've lost your subclass type, so it, it kind of overrides and now you're just back to using an observable. Um, and also there's, there's all these closures down here uh, when we subscribe to the source that really should exist on a subscriber prototype somewhere. Um, we don't need to allocate them every time. So that's where Lyft comes in. Um, this is how map would be written in Lyft. Um, really, map is just a function that takes a projector and then calls Lyft. So all of the operators want to call Lyft. Um, Lyft takes a map operator, which is just a class instance that has a call function. Uh, it, the map operator can store anything on its prototype it wants, but then whenever call is invoked, it's supposed to take the observer that you give it and then pass that to a new subscriber. So let's say I'm subscribing, I'm the first subscriber, then I subscribe to the map thing, the map thing gets told about me, and then the map thing is subscribes to the source. Um, so that's how you kind of uh, create the chain in a different way without using closures. Um, this way is super, super fast. Also, it gives us the benefit that it delegates the new observable creation to the function. So if you're gonna subclass observable, all you have to do is override lift. So this is kind of cool because we've never when you called flat map, you got back out an observable um, and you lost all your custom methods. What this also allows us to do is if you use something like WebSockets where you have subjects that are two-way communication, um, you could never flat, flat map those either because you get out observables. So we can maintain the bi-directionality of communication and potentially in the future just put in back pressure support too. Um, the way that RX Java did. So we're keeping that open as an option. So this is kind of an example of using a mouse observable. I have uh, a demo of this that I might be able to show at the end um, if I can get through this fast enough where I'm subclassing observable. Uh, I'm overriding lift to return a new instance of the mouse observable. So every time you call a function like an operator on the mouse observable, you're gonna get a, a new mouse observable. I added these two little functions down here to track the velocity and uh, then also concatenate friction events. Um, and the, that's kind of a stub. And then here's how I'm using it. So if I do, this is sort of a canonical RX drag drop example, where you have um, an observable from the mouse down event that you flat map, and inside of that you return all of the mouse moves until a mouse up, but I've added my own uh, tricky little things here with the mouse observable tracking the velocity as the user is moving their mouse. And then at the very end, concat friction says, all right, once they've finished, let's take the most recent event start with that velocity and then fake a bunch of events. So whoever's subscribing to this doesn't know that they're getting fake events. Uh, and then of course we throttle and then we render. Um, also, so WebSockets, this is really useful if you've got uh, streaming stuff or um, little Bluetooth devices you talk to that talk over WebSockets. Uh, in this case, I'm telling Navi to shut up. All right, simple unit tests, marble diagrams. If anybody's ever seen this, this is from the documentation. Um, actually, Andre Stoltz had the best idea I've ever heard, which is why can't we just write our unit tests as marble diagrams? Because that makes a whole lot more sense than like having an 18 line thing that checks numbers. Um, so this is kind of what our, our unit tests look like right now. Um, so you, you tell it what your observable is, you tell it what you're expecting to get out at the end, and then you say, expect observable, you know, filter to be this string. Um, and that's it. That's the, the crash course in the new RX. Great. If, if you want, I can actually, I can actually just real quick show that little demo. Okay, so it's, let's, let's get back to the, yeah. to the screen. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yep, okay. All right, so this is something I did actually, like, a while ago when I first joined Netflix. This is a, a virtualized scrolling list. Um, well, wait a minute. 
I don't know why it's not scrolling faster. There we go. It's scrolling, so it's all it's doing all the all the scrolling natively. It's not doing any sort of um, it's not using native scroll bars, it's doing UI recycling, it's not doing any reflow, it's using CSS to move. Um, and then it's doing all the, the tracking velocity and, and slowing down with friction. I don't know why it's, there we go. It just, and, and it just runs super fast. And this is actually in an older version of RX, but this is just, like everybody's always like, <clears throat> oh, RX is so slow. Um, and it's a lot of times, it can be, but it's also in how people use things. Also, before I go, if anybody, um, I just want to point these out. These are two uh, files which are kind of buried really, really deep in the documentation, but this is kind of the most common complaint I see about Rx is that there's too many operators, and I totally agree. Um, but there's a decision tree uh, for static operators. If you're like, oh, I have this problem, and what do I need, you know, what operator do I use? Um, you can say, I want to create a new sequence that iterates over an asynchronous element. Okay, bam, right there. Um, and the same thing for the instance operators. If you're ever looking for the right operator to do something, you're like, it must be there. You can just go to this decision tree. Um, it's in doc slash getting started. So, all right. Okay, cool. Well, let's move to the questions. Let's, yeah, let's yeah. do like uh, two or three questions. Sure. How are observ uh, observable different from ES6 generators? Um, ES6 generators are actually closer to enumerables. They're, they're poll based. Um, although there is that weird like talking back to them thing. Um, observables are push. So you, you subscribe to the observable, you give it three callbacks, and then it decides if it wants to call those whenever. Um, it's also different because the generator is, uh, once you've enumerated a result from it, it's exhausted, you can't re-enumerate it, uh, which feels like kind of a flaw, but whatever. Um, bacon. Bacon is multicast by default, actually, where there's a big discussion about that right now. Um, the, the, the idea that observable is a function, uh, in Rx land, they call that cold. Um, I don't know why it's really easier to understand if you think about it, an async function. But bacon, the observables aren't always cold. Um, but the problem is, if you go from cold to hot, hot meaning, meaning that you have a subscription <coughs> that is a, a subject that has a list of observers, just like an event emitter, um, you can never really go back to being cold or purely functional. So um, you have to kind of have the, the, the functional primitive, and then you can sort of graduate to sharing the, the events if you need to. Um, how do we manage to perform improvements? Improve performance. Uh, all of those techniques, uh, moving to lift, uh, revamping the schedulers. We do things like object pulling or we recycle the same scheduled action. Um, we, we, we basically went and said, all right, let's be functionally pure about everything, but then let's find all of the places that using dirty mutable state can like save us a bunch of time and money. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, why is it incorrect to call it load ash for events? It's like, the idea is great, but Lodash works on arrays, and arrays aren't functions. Arrays are mutable things. The, a better thing, like a better example would be the I enumerable type in C sharp. Um, I enumerables or, or uh, iterators in, no, iterables in Java, um, essentially are, are factories for an iterator. So you can always go back and re-enumerate something, um, and that's why it's not necessarily the same thing as Lodash. Uh, you're not performing a calculation whenever you do, um, a, you know, a map and a filter sequence. Another thing that's different is in Lodash, you, you know, if you're going to do map and then filter, well, you're creating an inter intermediate array to store all the results of the map operation. Then you're creating another intermediate array to store all the results of the filter operation. So you just created two arrays there. So you exhausted it to create map, then you did all the filter stuff. Well, in Rx, it's not that way since it's kind of a pipeline. One event goes through the map thing, then it immediately goes through the filter thing, and then you immediately get it. And then the second event goes through kind of like that. So, um, um, what, Falcor, oh. Fal that's the one, one last one, yeah? Yeah, uh, Falcor will totally uh, be compatible with Rx because the result of Falcor has a subscribe function, and Rx works with any object that has a subscribe function. Um, it's just internally, uh, we didn't need it anymore. We were using it to do some complex asynchronous state handling that we don't have to do anymore. Cool. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you.
And it's last time probably you're gonna be in the in the room back and you can you can have your group of people.